In the summer of 1988, a wealthy Jackson, Mississippi woman disappeared from her home in broad daylight. The only clue left behind was a mysterious ransom note. The FBI and local police struggled to find answers in its cryptic message so they could find the kidnapper and retrieve the victim before her time ran out. A daring kidnapping and a bizarre ransom note baffled Mississippi authorities. The victim was the wife of a wealthy businessman. A list of 12 names and a few drops of blood were the only clues to her fate. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The ransom note gave the FBI its first leads, but the case was not so clear cut. Solving it required the keen insight of a criminal profiler, and the perseverance of a family, local authorities, and the FBI. Six AM, July 26, nineteen eighty eight. The heat of a midsummer day would soon bear down on the southern city of Jackson, Mississippi. Like every weekday for the past 48 years, Annie Laurie Heron had coffee with her husband Robert before he left for work. As early investors in oil, the Herons had become one of Mississippi's wealthiest couples, with a fortune estimated at more than $100 million. That day, Annie Laurie Heron would host her bridge club at home the same house where she raised two children and lived with her husband since they were newlyweds. By 3.30, Mrs. Heron's bridge game was over and her friends had left. The housekeeper finished cleaning up after the card game and checked if Mrs. Heron needed anything else. The 73-year-old woman said everything was fine. Annie Heron planned to spend the rest of her afternoon reading until her husband returned. She wasn't expecting anyone, but perhaps one of the bridge players or the housekeeper had forgotten something. Her husband wasn't due home for an hour. Hey, how are you, ma'am? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. You got to see your husband. I have a letter. I'm back to see him. Yeah. Not on my way at all. Let me Annie Laurie Heron was on her own. At about 4.30 that afternoon, Robert Heron returned from work. Annie, I'm home. He saw that his wife wasn't home and figured she was out with her friends or daughter. When she hadn't returned by 5.30, he thought it was strange that his wife of 48 years hadn't called or left a note. House seemed to be empty. Annie. Robert grew concerned and began calling family and friends. Uh, anywhere that I can tell. No one had seen no, Annie the since the bridge game. Maybe, uh, maybe we're going to have to do something else. Thank you. Robert's son-in-law, who lived nearby, said he would be right over. The son-in-law said he and his wife hadn't heard from Mrs. Heron that day. Robert Heron pointed out that when Annie left the house, she usually took her purse. But his wife's purse and shoes sat beside her reading chair. Her newspaper and glasses were nearby. You know, we're just... I, I just don't know what to say. 
Robert was worried since Mrs. Heron's medicine for a chronic intestinal disease was still in the bathroom. She would need to take it soon or she would not be able to absorb food. The men continued to search for some indication of where she'd gone. A piece of paper near the front door caught the son-in-law's eye. It was a ransom note without specific instructions. Annie Laurie Heron had been kidnapped. We've got to do something real fast. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 separate men before 10 days passed, but it didn't say how much or where to send the money. He was ordered not to call police, so he waited for a ransom call with instructions on getting his wife back. When none came by nightfall, he contacted the Jackson Police Department despite being warned not to. Officers secured the ransom note, hoping to keep any fingerprints intact. Processing the house for evidence, officers discovered a trace of what appeared to be blood on the front door frame. Laboratory tests would later reveal that it was blood and that it matched Mrs. Heron's blood type. A Jackson police detective interviewed Robert Heron. They wanted to know if he or his wife had ever been threatened. He had no idea who would want to harm them. If Mrs. Heron were without her medication for long, her intestinal condition would become critical. Kidnapping is a crime that must be solved quickly, or the chances of rescuing the victim are slim. That evening, Jackson police contacted Special Agent Patrick McGlennon of the FBI's Jackson Field Office to bring the resources of the federal government to bear right away. Under the federal kidnapping statute, the FBI has jurisdiction whenever an individual is, uh, is kidnapped in the United States. Uh, the presumption in this case, of course, was uh, a kidnapping had occurred, a ransom demand had been made, and uh, the possibility of travel interstate is in fact why the FBI gets involved in these types of matters. The FBI called U.S. Attorney James Tucker, who would advise investigators in legal matters as the case developed. Like most residents of Jackson, Tucker had great admiration for the Herons. Robert Heron was a self-made man, and uh, at the time of this incident, which was uh, 1988, uh, Mr. Heron was probably considered one of the foremost uh, financial wizards uh, uh, here in the Jackson area. Uh, he was well known in, in the business community. Uh, he was uh, uh, a generous person, so he was becoming uh, well known for his particular acts of generosity. By dawn the next day, FBI agents and evidence technicians arrived at the Herons' home. The Jackson police detective filled in the case agent on what they'd learned so far. The FBI set up a satellite command post at the residence and tapped the Heron's phone, ready to trace any ransom calls. There was little doubt that multi-millionaire Robert Heron was the real target. Yet Mr. Heron hadn't been told what to pay to get his wife back. It was impossible to comply, or nearly impossible to comply, with the demands because they were nonspecific in nature. Mrs. Heron was not even mentioned in the note. There was no provision for her safe return. The note did say that the 12 men listed had been involved in the same photography company. Robert Heron explained that he had once served as chairman of the board for that company. Some of the company's franchisees had been sued to recoup losses, but Heron did not know which ones. It seemed unlikely that the 12 men named had kidnapped Mrs. Heron, but perhaps one or more of them was striking back at the company through Robert Heron. Technicians collected samples of all the writing pads and paper in the Heron's home. They would compare the paper to the ransom note to see if it had been written on the stock from the house.
The results would take a few days. Investigators searched outside the house for hairs, blood, clothing, anything that might reveal the kidnapper's identity. They looked for cigarette butts or evidence of food or drink, signs that someone had been watching the house. They found nothing. And yesterday afternoon, Neighbors and domestic workers reported seeing nothing strange at the house the previous afternoon, and no one had seen Mrs. Heron leave. The next day, agents continued canvassing the Heron's neighborhood. Dr. Posey? They questioned a doctor who lived down the street. He said that he had seen something in the neighborhood recently that might be related to the kidnapping. Two weeks earlier, the doctor was going to run errands when he drove past a white van parked near his house. From that position, anyone in the van would have a clear view of the Heron house. Hey, well, here? Yeah, about 50 At first, the doctor thought nothing of it. But when he'd returned home hours later, the van was still there. Thinking the driver needed help, the doctor offered his assistance. Can I help you with anything? That's it. If you need some help. The driver responded by asking if there was a law against parking in the neighborhood. It was an odd response, enough to make the doctor remember the incident. He said the van drove away minutes later. Agents continued to canvass the Heron's neighborhood and found another neighbor who had seen a white van on the street three months earlier. The other neighbor had seen a van similar to the, that described by the first individual sitting almost directly in front of the Heron residence in the very earliest days of April of 1988. Uh, she was suspicious enough of the van to get the license plate number. If investigators could find that van, they might also find Mrs. Heron. But a computer check revealed that the license plate had been stolen from a car at the New Orleans airport. It was another dead end. After 36 hours of investigation and no ransom calls, agents hoped lab results on the note would provide a fresh lead to Mrs. Heron or her abductor. FBI examiners first determined that the note had been typed on paper foreign to the Heron's home. They also compared the typeface to known samples from every typewriter made in this century. The laboratory division was able to determine that the demand letter was in fact typed by a royal typewriter manufactured between 1912 and 1927. There was nothing else contained on the demand letter which would give analysts any type of ability to tell us the manufacturer of the paper or whether there were any indented writing or other evidence on the letter. A latent fingerprint examination revealed nothing, and a spot on the note believed to be a blood stain was too small to analyze. Although no evidence on the note helped agents, they hoped its message would. The note demanded that Robert Heron pay 12 men who were involved with a photography company. Perhaps the kidnapper was among them. Agents learned that the company had foreclosed on each of the 12 men, all former franchisees, to collect heavy debts. One of the company's executives provided the FBI with company files and photos of those men. One was now deceased. The others were scattered throughout the country. At the FBI's Jackson Field Office, agents split up the 11 names and began to review the files and photographs. They sent leads to FBI offices in the towns and cities where the men currently lived, requesting additional information. Agents found that many had financial troubles. They tried to ascertain if those men had traveled near the Heron neighborhood when the white van was spotted there and again recently when the kidnapping occurred. 
FBI agents across the country began covert surveillance on the former franchisees. They hoped one of the men would lead them to the ailing 73-year-old woman. But as the kidnapping investigation stretched into its third day, only seven days remained on the ransom note deadline, and agents still lacked instructions on how to recover oh, yeah. Annie Laurie Heron alive. Hi, how are you, ma'am? Three days had passed Good. since Annie Laurie Heron, an elderly grandmother, had been abducted from her Jackson, Mississippi home in broad daylight. The FBI continued surveillance on 11 men named in the ransom note found inside the Herons' home. Agents couldn't confront the men. A frightened kidnapper might harm the victim. Special Agent Patrick McLennan hoped one of them would lead to the missing woman. We wanted to determine if they were traveling even small distances from their residences or business. Uh, we wanted to see if they perhaps were keeping Mrs. Heron at a uh, remote location where they might have to provide food, water, other conveniences for her, that they wouldn't want to be too far away from the victim. Despite the efforts of dozens of agents around the country, they discovered no direct leads to Mrs. Heron's whereabouts. But they still resisted contacting the 11 men directly so as not to reveal the investigation. The FBI considered the possibility that the kidnapper might be someone other than the men listed on the note. Agents contacted the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia for assistance. Profilers in the unit are agents trained to determine characteristics of criminals from the details of a case. One profiler reviewed the evidence, particularly the ransom note, looking for indications of the kidnapper's psychological makeup. The profiler called in his findings to the Jackson FBI agents working the Heron kidnapping. You mind if I put you on speaking fence so we can all listen at one time? In the conference call, the profiler confirmed that the kidnapper was likely one of the 11 suspects currently under surveillance. Nobody else would ever use. And since all those men had at least some college education, he believed one of them had intentionally misspelled words and used an old typewriter to throw off investigators. The profiler said the abduction was an act of revenge against Robert Heron by a paranoid individual who was willing to kill. The Behavioral Science Unit believed that a sole perpetrator was responsible for this crime, that it would be a white male of approximate middle age, and that the individual would probably be working alone, although if they were working in concert with someone else, that person would, would provide a very subordinate role. It's bad. The profiler also concluded that by this time, there was only a 50% chance that Annie Heron was still alive. One further detail caught the profiler's eye, a phrase that did not seem to match the rest of the note and might point to the profession of the kidnapper. The note said, pay them whatever damages are owed to them. If any is dead, pay their children. Damages was a, is, a, is a legal term. It was telling in that one of the individuals on that demand note was an attorney. Special Agent Tom Montgomery of the FBI's Jacksonville, Florida office was called in to investigate the attorney listed on the note, a man named N. Alfred Wynn. After we received the name of N. Alfred Wynn, we did the public record background checks. Uh, we also contacted the St. Petersburg Police Department, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, found that he had no criminal record, did our own computer checks also. Uh, we determined that he was a St. Petersburg attorney and that he lived above his office. Yeah. What's this all about? Well, I'm investigating a crime. An agent went to interview Wynn at his office residence. So, Mr. Wynn, uh, you were camping with the girl. Alfred Wynn said he had nothing to do with the kidnapping and explained where he was on July 26th, the day Mrs. Herring went missing. He had been at a bar with a prostitute. He said that on that evening, he had called his paralegal back at the office. 
He asked the employee to meet him at the bar to lend him $100 so he could go home with the prostitute. The paralegal promised to be right over. Wynn said he and the prostitute went outside. He stalled for time as he waited for his paralegal to show up with the money. The two were in Wynn's car when his assistant arrived. Wynne took the money, then left with the prostitute. Wynne said he didn't remember much about the evening. He didn't know the name of the bar or the prostitute's real name. The next day, Agents checked the alibi with Wynn's paralegal when the attorney was out of the office. He corroborated his boss's story and also claimed that he didn't know the bar's name since he had never been there before or since. Agents suspected both men were lying. We learned that Wynn had paid for the paralegal schooling at a local community college, uh, his paralegal schooling, we had learned that uh, he was working for basically a very uh, minimum salary and there was a lot of allegiance between the paralegal and, and Mr. Wynn. Um, Later, an agent re-interviewed Wynn's paralegal, explaining their suspicions. He maintained that he had met Wynn at the bar on the same day of the kidnapping, though he did reveal something new about his boss. He said that Wynn's legal battle with the photography company had begun when the company foreclosed on him seven years earlier, and that he had fought the lawsuit with a vengeance. He had attempted to declare bankruptcy three times in order to avoid paying his debts. Under a court order to recover the money, the U.S. Marshal's office had confiscated Wynn's valuables, including 1,000 shares of expensive stock. They also impounded Wynn's European sports coupe, a car the paralegal said Wynn loved. In addition, they put his St. Petersburg office up for auction. On July 6, 1988, less than three weeks before Mrs. Heron disappeared, Wynn had been notified of an eviction hearing. But he had refused to leave. The paralegal said that Wynn had been furious, okay, believing that the photography that? company had ruined you, uh, his life. Going to get that date for me? You're going to check that date. The FBI wondered if the paralegal had been involved in the kidnapping. Okay. Right, thanks. We pulled all vehicles registered to the paralegal, friends and associates of Mr. Wynn, to include Mr. Wynn, and learned that the paralegal had a white van registered to him. And through an interview of the paralegal, learned that the vehicle was utilized by Wynn on several occasions. It seemed to be a major breakthrough in the case. The vehicle identification number revealed the name of the previous owner. An agent went to interview her. She said Alfred Wynn, not his paralegal, had been the actual buyer. She said that Wynn had acted strangely. He was adamant that his name not be written on the title. So the woman left the line for the buyer's name blank. The lead was promising, but then agents learned that the van had been in the repair shop on the day of the kidnapping. Okay, how long was he gone? It was one more frustration in a difficult case. After more than a week, the FBI and U.S. Attorney James Tucker were no closer to finding Mrs. Heron. A case like this is extremely difficult when you don't have an eyewitness to any one of several situations. We did not have an eyewitness as to the abduction itself. We did not have an eyewitness that, that Newton, Alfred Wynn, 
or any of the other people listed in the particular note had ever been in Mrs. Heron's company. At the Jackson, Mississippi police station, investigators again met with the doctor who had seen a white van in the Heron's neighborhood. They hoped he could recognize the driver in a photo lineup. The neighbor quickly picked out the photo of Alfred Wynn. He was certain it was Wynn he saw reading a map in a white van across the street from his house in mid-July, less than two weeks before Mrs. Heron's abduction. The other neighbor, who had seen a similar van, also identified Wynn as the driver. It was clear to agents that Alfred Wynn was connected to the kidnapping of Annie Laurie Heron, yet they didn't know how. Thank you very much. We thought, because of the positive identification, that Wynn was definitely somehow involved in the kidnapping. If not the actual perpetrator, if not the man who walked up to the door and actually grabbed Mrs. Heron, he certainly was directing or calling the shots. Yep. FBI agents kept Wynn under surveillance. They believed that he could lead them to the missing woman. But as the deadline in the ransom note approached, hopes of finding the frail Mrs. Heron dimmed further. The day after the deadline in a ransom note, FBI agents and local detectives briefed the husband of kidnapped Jackson, Mississippi socialite Annie Laurie Heron in preparation for a televised appeal for his ailing wife's return. The note hadn't outlined specific steps to earn Mrs. Heron's release. FBI behavioral profilers hoped the press conference would prompt the kidnapper to contact Mr. Heron with instructions to get his wife back unharmed. With his son and daughter at his side, Robert Heron asked anyone with any information to come forward. As a businessman. He also spoke directly to the kidnapper, promising to follow any specific instructions. A week later, the plan seemed to have worked. On August 15, 1988, Robert Heron spotted the familiar handwriting of his wife among his mail. The envelope was postmarked August 12th from Atlanta, Georgia. Investigators were careful not to destroy any evidence that might have been left on it. Mr. Heron believed the letter was in his wife's handwriting, too. FBI lab examiners later confirmed that it was. In the letter, Mrs. Heron begged her husband to do what the kidnappers wanted, or they would seal her up in a cellar with only a few jugs of water. Though the letter provided no instructions on how to comply, for Special Agent Patrick McGlennon, it did bring new encouragement just when all hope of recovering Mrs. Heron alive seemed lost. When we received the August 15th letter, which was in Mrs. Heron's handwriting, it really lifted the spirits of everybody that was involved in the case. We felt reasonably sure that she was in good enough condition to write the letter, and we were going to get her back the same way. The letter itself had been dated August 10th, 15 days after the abduction. Yet no one could be sure Mrs. Heron was alive on that date. It was unclear if she had written the letter on her own or if the message was coerced, according to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery. Certain words utilized on the letter seal me up in the cellar with jugs of water. In talking to family members, we found out that those are not words that she would normally utilize. She would have used the word basement or bottles of water. So it is our belief that the letter was dictated to her. If the letter had been dictated, both the message and the date could be false. Having to guess at what exactly he should do, Mr. Heron wrote checks to all the men listed in the original ransom note, according to U.S. Attorney James Tucker. He had already instructed his people to make efforts to determine what financial situations he had had with each of the people that were listed in the original note. So he had some idea at that particular point about how much money 
had been involved with with each of those people. Mr. Heron settled on restitution, roughly equivalent to the amount the men had been ordered to pay in their franchise lawsuits. The total came to almost a million dollars. Heron sent $145,000 to the prime suspect, Alfred Wynn. Enclosed with each check was a note requesting the safe return of his wife. The FBI instructed the Postal Service to deliver the envelopes the next day. Later, agents spoke with Wynn's paralegal and learned of the attorney's reaction to Mr. Heron's check. When Mr. Wynn received his check in Tampa, Florida, he opened it, read the contents of the letter from Mr. Heron, turned to his paralegal and stated, this is not what I wanted. He told his paralegal that what he had wanted was to get his life back, the return of his confiscated car, jewelry, and other property. Wynne sent back the check with a note enclosed, saying he hoped Mrs. Heron would be returned safely. Agents now believe that Alfred Wynne had kidnapped Mrs. Heron for revenge against the photography company Heron once chaired, not for monetary gain. That meant it was less likely Mrs. Heron would ever be returned alive. Although some of the people receiving checks kept the money, most returned similar responses. Some of the people that Mr. Heron sent these checks to, sent the checks immediately back to him, sent letters or called on the telephone, expressing their regret to Mr. Heron that something like this could happen to his wife. They wanted nothing to do with the money, and they weren't going to benefit through his grief. Two and a half months passed without further word from Annie Heron's kidnapper. Considering her fragile health, chances were slim she would survive this long. In early November 1988, the case was featured on a national crime-solving television series. Agents around the country chased each of hundreds of leads called in. One call from a woman in Florida seemed especially promising. Although none of the names on the ransom note had been broadcast, she said that if Alfred Wynn were on the list, she had important information. The FBI learned that the Florida woman was a spiritual advisor, which did not initially bolster confidence among agents. But after a brief interview, they realized she had a strong reputation in the law enforcement field, having often assisted police in the past. The advisor told an agent she had first met N. Alfred Wynn four years earlier. In 1984, he had his first consultation, asking her advice about problems he had with the head of a photography company, the same company mentioned in the Heron ransom note. She instructed him to pursue his problems through the court system and take legal means, and he told her that he had already done that, it just didn't work. That's the big problem. That is the biggest problem. Wynne said he wanted to kidnap the head of the company and hold him hostage until he got what he wanted. He had the perfect place to put the man and said that he was looking for someone to help him. He called her a month and a half later to ask if she would help. She declined. The advisor provided the FBI with records of her work with Wynn. Once assured agents would protect her, she agreed to become a cooperating witness and promised to contact Wynn to arrange a meeting. FBI technicians would wire her office for sound and video. Our plan was to draw Mr. Wynn into a face-to-face -face meeting with her and to have them discuss their prior discussions of, of this kidnapping of Mr. Heron, as well as any of the other things that would verify exactly what he had said to her during their prior meetings. Alfred Wynn took the bait. The monitored meeting took place in early December 1988. 
FBI agents watched as Wynn approached the office. Agents hoped he would reveal the whereabouts of the missing woman. The advisor told Wynn she had seen the crime show on television and asked if he had kidnapped Annie Heron. FBI one, can you hear him in there? Wynn denied it, adding that he had decided not to abduct Robert Heron as he had previously discussed with the advisor. The recording corroborated the advisor's statement, but it didn't provide agents with the evidence needed to arrest Alfred Wynn. When Wynn left the office, FBI agents followed him. We hoped a meeting between Mr. Wynn and the psychic would lead him to, at the very least, check on the location of Mrs. Heron's body or lead us to a co-conspirator. But the suspect never went to visit a place where the body could have been kept. Weeks later, agents learned that Wynn owned a cabin in Florida's swampland, a perfect place to hide a body. Dead or alive, agents hoped they'd find Annie Heron there. They had no way of knowing if the house was booby-trapped or if someone was armed and waiting inside. Six months after 73-year-old Annie Heron was kidnapped in Mississippi, FBI agents hoped to find her in a remote Florida cabin owned by prime suspect Alfred Wynn. The message from the kidnapper had threatened that the elderly woman would be sealed alive in a cellar. But agents found no cellar. The police was empty of anything related to the kidnapping. FBI Special Agent Patrick McLennan and other investigators continued searching for the kidnapped woman nearby. We began to look in dry cisterns, some swamp area adjacent to those properties, the outbuildings, screened porches, whatever structures existed. We found no sign of Mrs. Heron, and no sign that anybody had ever stayed there for any length of time. Certainly no cellars. There were no cellars in that section of Florida. Annie Heron was still missing and presumed dead. Then, in late July of 1989, Alfred Wynn sent a filing cabinet to the IRS, challenging them to find disputed financial documents. All right, guys, we got the filing cabinet. We got the Wynn from the IRS. But he failed to check the cabinet thoroughly, and his arrogance would bring him down. Wynn, we believe, sent those thousands of documents to Internal Revenue Service as part of an effort to intimidate them uh, into leaving him alone. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a pattern that the agents discovered in regard to when conduct in, in a number of situations. Uh, he, his arrogance was demonstrated in his efforts to overpower whoever he was involved with at any particular point. When they found letters regarding a kidnapping and murder plot, IRS agents called the FBI. The documents outlined how Wynn and a former girlfriend had been planning to kidnap and kill the woman's husband. According to FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery, the similarities to Annie Heron's abduction were obvious. They mentioned utilizing an old typewriter to type a communication, and the first ransom note for Annie Laurie Heron was typed on an old 1920s vintage typewriter. They also mentioned detailed maps, uh, surveillance of the area. They also mentioned that it was actually Wynn that was going to do the crime. And the female was just going to help him and obtain what he needed. FBI agents tracked down Wynn's ex-girlfriend at the community college where she worked. They needed to question her about the plot outlined in the letters. At first, she claimed she knew nothing about the plot. But when reminded that interfering with an investigation was itself a crime, she decided to cooperate. When the last time you saw him was a few years ago? She said the plot to kill her husband was Wynn's idea. 
When she realized he was serious, she had broken up with Wynn. Agents asked if she had had any contact with him since then. She said that a year earlier, in early August 1988, Wynn had asked her to meet him at a motel in Deland, Florida. It was just days after Annie Heron had been kidnapped. Wynn acted paranoid, silently handing her a note that asked if her car was bugged and if she'd been followed. When he was convinced it was safe, he began talking. What's this all about? Wynne asked her to mail a letter for him, offering her $500 plus travel expenses. First of all, did I touch it? She agreed, and he paid her half in advance, $250. Wynne handed her an envelope wrapped in a gray linen napkin. Then he gave her very specific instructions. She was not to touch the envelope or even look at the address. Wynne ordered her to mail it from Atlanta, buy the airline tickets under a false name, and fly into and out of two different airports. He instructed her to change her appearance before the trip. She complied, changing her clothes, jewelry, and hair in the women's restroom at the airport. Once in Atlanta, she was to mail the envelope precisely on August 11th. But the woman told agents it was late in the day when she made it to a mailbox. At the last moment, she said she couldn't resist a glance at the address. The letter allegedly sent by Annie Laurie Heron was postmarked on August 12th from Atlanta. Have you seen this Agents before? showed the woman a photo of the envelope Robert Heron had received. She immediately recognized the distinctive handwriting. It was the envelope she had mailed. She said that she had thrown away the napkin used to carry the envelope on a rural road. She offered to take them there once she finished work. That evening, she brought the agents to the area. Investigators knew there was little chance they would find the napkin on the roadside after more than a year, but they looked anyway. They needed it to corroborate her story. Against all odds, they found it. But they wanted an admission in Alfred Wynn's own words. With a solid cooperating witness, agents were getting closer to arresting Wynn. At the FBI's request, Wynn's ex-girlfriend agreed to be wired for an audio tape meeting between herself and Wynn. We had hoped that Mr. Wynn would discuss facets of the crime, that he would tell her what she had accomplished by sending the letter to the Heron residence, that he would thank her for her help, that he would pay her. The woman called Wynn and set up a meeting. Agents had instructed her to try to draw Wynn out about the trip to Atlanta. As hoped, yep, Wynn gave for. his ex-girlfriend the $250 he still owed her for mailing the envelope. Wynn refused to talk in detail about his plan, and he never mentioned Annie Laurie Heron. He seemed to have stonewalled investigators again. Convinced he was involved and desperate to find Mrs. Heron, the FBI knew they had to arrest Wynn soon. On March 11, 1989, the FBI was ready to arrest suspected kidnapper Alfred Wynn. They set up a second meeting with Wynn's former girlfriend, who had begun cooperating with authorities. The ex-girlfriend had been wired so agents could record the conversation. 
They hoped Wynn would say something incriminating about the kidnapping of Annie Heron so they could charge him and recover Mrs. Heron or her body. FBI Special Agent Tom Montgomery had coached the informant on how to deal with Wynn in this crucial second meeting. We had instructed her to become more aggressive in this meeting and to basically indicate to him that she was aware that she was involved in, in a criminal act, that she'd been watching television, and that uh, she now realized that the letter that she mailed may in fact be in, involved in the kidnapping, may have been a second ransom note, hoping to elicit from him something to incriminate him further. Agents watched and listened as the woman pushed Wynn about the Heron kidnapping. The suspect soon became defensive and left the car without admitting any knowledge of the crime. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Agents knew it was time to make their move. The element of surprise is critical to a safe arrest. Alfred Wynn was charged with conspiracy to kidnap, mailing a threatening communication, and perjury for testifying in front of a grand jury that he wasn't involved in the kidnapping. But agents still had no solid proof that he or an accomplice had in fact abducted Annie Heron. In Wynn's car, agents discovered several maps of Mississippi, one with a Jackson exit marked on it in pen and notes in the margin. Agents thought these might indicate where Mrs. Heron's body had been placed, but extensive searches yielded nothing. Securing a warrant, Florida FBI agents searched Wynn's office. They needed physical evidence to prove Wynn was involved in the abduction of Annie Laurie Heron. Their hopes rose when they spotted a vintage typewriter. Special Agent McGlennon recalled that FBI examiners had determined the ransom note was typed on a 1920s era royal typewriter, the exact model recovered from Wynn's office. This seemed to be a very significant break. In my mind, this was the typewriter upon which Wynn typed the initial demand note that was left in the Heron's home. We sent it to the lab, fully expecting them to come back with a report saying, this is the, the exact typewriter that composed that letter. The FBI lab determined that the typewriter found in Wynn's office was not the one used to type the ransom note. Agents believed Wynn had planted a different typewriter to bring doubt to later prosecution. They had also found a business card for a van rental company in Wynn's office. How you doing? The company Major owner said the Alfred Wynn had rented white vans three times. Uh, I'm the manager. Okay. Each time he had driven more than 500 miles, uh, yes, just 100 miles more than the round trip to the Heron's uh, residence. Yes, I do, but I don't have a the rental times did not coincide with the date of the abduction but one did match the date when Alfred Wynn was cited in the Heron's neighborhood. U.S. Attorney James Tucker had little evidence to prove his case. He believed that Wynn and his paralegal were lying about the suspect being with a prostitute on the day of the kidnapping. We went back and confronted the paralegal with this false alibi. The agents and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him, at which he decided that he better tell us that all that was a lie and that, uh, and that uh, Mr. Wynn had, in fact, been out of his law offices and out of pocket during the entire time that, uh, that the abduction occurred, which would have been the crucial dates, the 24th through about the 28th. This would help prove perjury, but it wasn't enough to charge Wynn with the crime they were certain he had committed, the kidnapping and murder of Annie Laurie Heron. The federal trial for conspiracy to kidnap began in Mississippi on January 29, 1990. 
Throughout the investigation and the two-week trial which occurred in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Wynn professed his innocence. But at the conclusion, a jury of his peers found him guilty for the crimes for which he was charged. N. Alfred Wynn received the maximum sentence allowed, 19 years and seven months for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. He has no chance of parole from the federal prison in Coleman, Florida. We have never to this day resolved where Mrs. Heron is now, and the family deserves to know that. In fact, as far as this office is concerned, we still carry this as an open matter and will continue to do so until such time as uh, somebody steps forward and uh, helps us out with locating where Mrs. Heron is. Family deserves it. Mr. Robert Heron died of a heart attack on November 28, 1990. In May of 1991, Mrs. Annie Laurie Heron was declared dead to allow the settlement of the couple's estate. The Heron family still hopes to someday learn what happened to their mother, to begin to heal their pain, and to finally lay her to rest. In Memphis, Tennessee, a horrible crime terrified local residents. Most never heard the young mother's screams, but they felt the loss. As local authorities searched for the perpetrator, they found many who had motive. Investigators were forced to consider whether this was a random act of violence or a crime of deliberate calculation. When a wealthy young woman was abducted in front of her in-law's home, the police had no shortage of suspects. The 25-year-old victim left behind a tumultuous marriage, an ex-husband and old boyfriends. All were on the FBI's short list. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As suspects are interviewed, the case grew no clearer. To find the woman and her abductor, investigators would have to first determine the motive. Tunica County, Mississippi, just south of Memphis, Tennessee, is America's third largest gambling destination. 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson had recently become one of the regulars. On April 19, 1996, the housewife from nearby Memphis, Tennessee, visited her favorite casino. Shannon was having a good night. She managed to turn $500 into $5,000 at the high-stakes blackjack table. At 3.30 a.m., she cashed out and headed home. Um, sure. Can I have security? Security. When players win big, most casinos provide a security escort to protect customers from theft. This casino was no exception. Upon Shannon's request, a guard followed her to the parking area. Oh, great. It was an hour's drive to Shannon's home in Memphis through secluded roads. She knew the route well. She loved to win, but could afford to lose. Less than a year earlier, she'd married her boss, a multi-millionaire who was 33 years her senior. Earlier that evening, she had dropped off her three young children from her previous marriage at the home of their grandparents in Northeast Memphis. It was about 4.45 a.m. when Shannon pulled into the grandparents' driveway to pick up her children. She needed to get them off to school on time in the morning. Did you hear that? Inside the house, Shannon's former in-laws were awakened by a piercing scream. 
Her former father-in-law rushed to the window to see Shannon struggling with someone in a baseball cap. What is it? He raced to assist her. Neighbors also heard the commotion and witnessed the crime. Within seconds, the mother of three had been abducted less than 50 feet from the front door. The distraught grandfather called 911. Memphis police were immediately dispatched. In kidnapping cases, a quick response can mean the difference between life and death. Police arrived within minutes and interviewed Shannon's former father. Memphis police captain Richard David Wilson, a sergeant at the time, recalls that the shaken man did his best to recall what he had seen. Her ex-father-in-law heard a commotion and observed a car driving away. At the same time, some other neighbors on the street heard the commotion and, and also looked out and saw a car drive away and gave a description of the driver and description of the car. Despite the dim light, witnesses agreed that the driver had worn a red baseball cap but their descriptions of the vehicle varied. Some described it vaguely as dark colored and sporty. Another witness was certain that it was a maroon Chevy Beretta. None of them could describe the driver's face. On the driveway close to the street, police found two metal buttons assumed to have been torn from Shannon's clothing. Close by, they recovered a single artificial fingernail. The victim's car was searched, but police found nothing to suggest the identity of her abductor or Shannon's whereabouts. Her ex-father-in-law had seen Shannon earlier that evening when she had dropped off her children. He and his wife had agreed to babysit their grandchildren while Shannon celebrated her new husband's birthday at the casino. You guys, what's going on? Man, it's good to see you. Their former daughter-in-law had divorced their son less than a year before. Still, their relationship with her remained amicable, and she visited regularly with the children. Shannon's former father-in-law told police the name of the casino where Shannon and her new husband liked to play. The casino confirmed she'd been there and won $5,000, but no one could say if she was with anyone in particular. Later that day, news that the mother of three was abducted just steps from where her children slept horrified local residents, according to Memphis District Attorney Jerry Kitchen. She appeared to be a person who was uh, very conscious about the upbringing of her children because she had uh, returned back to Memphis uh, to pick her children up to make sure that they got to school. Memphis police questioned Shannon's ex-husband, who was the father of her three children. Is anybody here with you after 11 No, sir. Okay. No, thank you, Give me a gentleman a minute. Thanks, sweetie. He was at work when the abduction occurred in front of his parents' home. Though his relationship with Shannon had been stormy, they remained married for almost eight years. They finally divorced after Shannon fell in love with her present husband. Memphis police were reluctant to eliminate him as a suspect so early in the investigation, though Shannon's ex-husband's alibi was solid. Who knows the reason why people get a divorce, but there's always got, I've never heard of a good divorce. She still made him pay alimony, even though she was married to a wealthy person. And join us. Police look to her present husband to learn more. Since he was a multimillionaire, they considered the possibility that Shannon may have been kidnapped for ransom. He owned a large security company here in Memphis, and he was well known. Everybody wanted to help him because they knew him or knew of him. And being that he 
was wealthy, she would be a prime target to be kidnapped for money. So far, he had received no ransom call or letter. He'd been distraught since being woken at 5 a.m. with the news of his wife's abduction. Regrettably, the last time they'd spoken that night, they'd had a fight. Happy birthday to you. It was his 58th birthday, and his teenage daughters from a previous marriage had stopped by to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> that same evening, his wife Shannon had planned to take him to the casino. Hello? Hi, sweetie. After dropping off her children, she called to say that she was on the way to pick him up. He told her he wasn't ready. His daughters were there, and he wanted to spend more time with them before going out. No. Shannon became angry. According to her husband, she felt he was putting his children ahead of their plans. He told her he could be ready in a half hour, but she hung up on him. Hello? He expected that she'd cool down and pick him up. But when he tried to call later, she did not answer. She, she and I are just... Uh, I guess there's just such a difference in our age. Police asked if he knew anyone who might want to harm Shannon. The last thing I said, she said to me was The husband mentioned an ex-boyfriend against whom Shannon had filed charges of harassment a year earlier. He believed the ex-boyfriend drove a Chevy Beretta. At headquarters, police checked with DMV but found no records that her ex-boyfriend or any of his family owned a Beretta. A criminal background check did confirm that a judge had ordered her ex-lover to have no contact with Shannon over the past year. Investigators went to question Shannon's ex-boyfriend, but he was not at home, nor had he shown up for work. His sister lived in the same neighborhood, a few blocks from where Shannon had been abducted. She reported that she had seen a suspicious car drive past her house on the night of the crime. She was out on the porch around the time of the abduction when a maroon Chevy Beretta sped by, heading out of the neighborhood. She said she didn't recognize the driver at first. Did you have to? But when she saw a photo of Shannon's wealthy husband in a news report, she was sure it was him. Though Memphis police had first considered the possibility that Shannon had been abducted for ransom, they now began to consider another possibility. It's always in the back of your mind due to her being married to a wealthy person and the difference in their ages that uh, something could have happened to her to get rid of her um, there was, we just didn't know so we tried to cover every angle that we could memphis police asked shannon's husband to provide a formal statement the reason i've asked you here today is with his lawyer present he filled in detectives about his relationship with shannon police knew that he had met shannon while she was still married working at the security company he owned She worked for him, but soon their relationship took a personal turn. Their romance led to marriage, but the magic didn't last long. nothing else that you can think of. Nine months later, they began negotiating a post-nuptial agreement, outlining terms in the event the troubled union broke. Both had previous marriages that ended in divorce, and Shannon needed to feel certain that she would retain custody of her children. They'd filed it just 10 days before Shannon's abduction. I'm feeling uh, sufficiently well to come to. Shannon's husband emphasized that it was his wife who wanted the agreement. He claimed money was not the issue since they kept separate bank accounts. You do realize. When police asked, the husband agreed to reinforce his statement with a polygraph. This meeting. To cover all possibilities, police checked local morgues, jails, and hospitals. 
But after a week, investigators had no solid leads to Shannon's whereabouts. Police in Memphis received dozens of calls from local residents. Most were well-intentioned, but unproductive. Uh-huh. And your name again? All had to be checked. Yes, ma'am, and thanks for the call. One was from a woman named Sharon Powers in nearby Clarksdale, Mississippi, 80 miles south of Memphis. The abduction was reported in the paper and on the news, and a description of the car was given. She had contacted the Memphis Police Department saying that she thought that maybe her husband was involved uh, because of the description of the car. She told Mississippi police that she believed her husband, Lee, may fit the suspect description. The day after the crime was reported, he had worn a red cap and left town in their red Chevy Beretta to see his mother. The woman said that she and her husband had been fighting. Police asked her to have him call when he returned. They weren't optimistic. Her report sounded like a possible domestic dispute unrelated to the crime. On May 3rd, 1996, police responded to another call from a concerned citizen trying to help. At a casino in Tunica County, Mississippi, a witness believed he had spotted Shannon Sanderson dressed as a casino employee. But when an officer approached her, he realized that it was a case of mistaken identity. It was one more call among hundreds of false leads that frustrated the investigation. After two weeks of searching, local investigators were no closer to finding the missing mother of three. Her family was left only with the hope that she was still alive. In the spring of 1996, Memphis police continued their search for 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson, who had been abducted from the front of her former in-law's home. Investigators had questioned her wealthy husband, past lovers, and area residents, but none offered clues to her whereabouts. In any investigation, authorities try first to eliminate those people closest to the victim. After more than two weeks of searching, Memphis Police Captain Richard David Rolson feared that time was running out. Due to her past uh, boyfriends and lovers, we just didn't know what happened, but as the days went by, the chances of finding her alive were slimmer and slimmer. On May 6th, Shannon's ex-boyfriend finally came in for questioning. He had only recently completed his year-long probation of harassment charges against Shannon. He claimed to be asleep in his mother's house at the time of her abduction. According to the ex-boyfriend, he avoided Shannon as his probation required, but Shannon continued to call him, complaining that she wasn't happy with her new marriage. He added that he would have to talk to his lawyer before agreeing to take a polygraph. He remained a potential suspect. But as with Shannon's husband, no hard evidence existed to prove nor disprove his involvement. Then, on May 9th, 1996, 40 miles south from where Shannon had been abducted, sheriffs in DeSoto County, Mississippi, were called to a rural plot of land in the town of Eudora. Two people had been inspecting their new property when they noticed a strong odor. Then they discovered a woman's decomposing body. The DeSoto County crime scene technicians set up a grid around the immediate area. Item. They conducted a line search, looking for anything that might be a clue. Go. They labeled and recorded every item they came item. across as they drew closer to the body. 15 feet away, they found a woman's high-heeled shoe. Go.
Closer to the body, they marked the location of another. DeSoto sheriffs checked their records, but found no women reported missing locally. They broadened their search to include larger towns and cities in the region. When they contacted Memphis authorities, police there told them that a 25-year-old mother of three named Shannon Sanderson had been missing for more than two weeks. DeSoto deputies learned that she was blonde, approximately 5'5", 130 pounds, had a small tattoo, and was last seen wearing a dress, high heels, a jacket with metal buttons, and pink artificial fingernails. That description fit the body, but they needed an autopsy to confirm her identity and cause of death. The medical examiner determined that the victim had been killed by a single 25 caliber bullet to the right temple. Yes, sir. Date and time. The victim's clothes were removed and preserved to check for trace evidence that might lead to the killer. The body, dead an estimated two to three weeks, was too decomposed to recognize. But over her left breast, examiners found a small tattoo that was still visible. It said, I love you, Robert. Mm -hmm. okay. Shannon Sanderson had such a tattoo. The medical examiner compared her dental records to x-rays from the body. Okay. Definitely. They confirmed the ID. This was Shannon Sanderson's body. The abduction was now officially a homicide. In Memphis, Assistant District Attorney Jerry Kitchen was called in. His first task would be to somehow narrow the suspect list the police had developed over the past three weeks. Here in Memphis, it's somewhat unusual in that we have relatively few uh, murder cases that we would classify as mystery homicides where uh, someone's not either developed as a suspect rather quickly or arrested uh, soon after the incident. Um, but in this particular case, uh, it was a mystery uh, homicide with numerous suspects that uh, were listed as potentially being involved in the abduction and, and killing of the victim. The assistant district attorney first called the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation to conduct polygraph examinations to help eliminate potential suspects. He also contacted the FBI, since Shannon's body was found across the Tennessee state line. Supervisory Special Agent Jennifer Aiken from the FBI's Memphis field office was assigned as case agent. They felt they needed some additional resources. The case was a very difficult case. It crossed jurisdictions, and they wanted the FBI to be involved as part of the team um, working towards a solution, because it was, it was not an easy, an easy case. Memphis authorities hoped that Agent Aiken's experience would help unravel the complexities of this case. Local residents were fearful that Shannon's killer was still out there, not knowing if or when he would strike again. In the spring of 1996, the body of 25-year-old Shannon Sanderson, a mother of three, was found in Eudora, Mississippi, 40 miles from her Memphis, Tennessee home. The FBI, together with state and local investigators, needed to shorten the lengthy suspect list that included Shannon's husband and past lovers. Assistant District Attorney Jerry Kitchen hoped polygraph examinations could help focus their search. This investigation was difficult in that there were a lot of suspects in this particular case. Throughout the victim's life, she had, of course, been divorced. And naturally, in any type of murder case, so uh, you, some, you, you do focus in and you do look at uh, relatives or acquaintances or husbands, uh, any type of relationship that the victim may have been involved in that uh, uh, could uh, lead back to some type of dispute or domestic uh, violence. Tennessee state authorities tested several of Shannon's ex-lovers. They asked them their whereabouts on the night of the abduction. 
They asked directly if they had abducted or killed Shannon. All denied any involvement. The tests revealed no deception. Investigators corroborated their alibis and eliminated them as potential suspects. They also polygraphed the witness who claimed to have seen Shannon's current husband driving a maroon Chevy Beretta in the neighborhood moments before the abduction occurred. It was the same type of vehicle other witnesses had described that Shannon was forced into. But the woman was found to be deceptive. These are Becky's charts. The police now believed her claim was false, that she had seen Shannon's husband driving the getaway vehicle. They also knew that Shannon's brief marriage with her wealthy husband had been rocky. They wanted to confirm once and for all that he had not been involved in any way. This crime occurred at 4 o'clock in the morning. The victim's husband had indicated that he went to bed and that there was no one else that he was with. And so he really had no alibi. And so that was an area that was difficult for us to get over uh, because we could not lock down exactly where he was and what he was doing without, uh, other than what he was telling us. Investigators contacted Shannon's husband to be polygraphed. Though he had previously agreed to do so, on advice from his lawyer, he declined. Heart medication that he was taking may have induced a false reading, according to his lawyer. Are you feeling? For Captain Rolson, the husband's refusal didn't alleviate the suspicions that surrounded him. You couldn't understand if he didn't have anything to do with it, why he wouldn't be wanting to cooperate. And being a homicide detective, you're suspicious, and and. Uh, it just made him that more suspicious. In terms of incriminating evidence, the investigation was at a standstill. Supervisory Special Agent Jennifer Aiken hoped to refocus the investigation by examining leads that may have been overlooked. We have to look at all of the possibilities, and, and that's you know part of the battle in the beginning, is not to get too far down the road in speculating about what kind of of guy this could be um, and and what you know what his relationship or no, you know non-relationship would be to the victim what we did then is identify what else what other possibilities um, do we still need to explore one possibility though not a promising one was Sharon Powers, who earlier reported that her husband may have matched the vague description of the suspect. But now she wasn't so sure about her previous claim. She told police she'd overreacted, reinforcing their belief that she'd only been trying to get back at her husband for leaving her. She said that her husband had left town, that they had had some, you know, marital disputes. They felt that perhaps um, this report was really just sort of sour grapes and that she was trying to get her husband, um, maybe a estranged husband, into trouble of some kind. So they really just simply did not know how much weight to give uh, this rather conflicting and, and kind of half-hearted story that she was telling. Though her husband wasn't a serious suspect, police wanted to talk with him. A bulletin for Gerald Lee Powers was issued that he was wanted for questioning in Tennessee. FBI agents and Tennessee investigators met to review the casino surveillance tape of the blackjack table where Shannon had won the now missing $5,000. Her growing pile of chips would certainly make her an attractive target. They viewed the tape to see if a stalker could be seen. But if that was the killer's intention, Agent Aiken questioned why he would wait so long to make his move. Clearly, she had been winning for a while. She was there late at night. 
there were a number of factors that made her visit to that casino rather high risk. And yet we had this abduction occurring almost an hour to an hour and a half after she left that environment. So first we had to determine, did it have anything or nothing to do with her visit to that casino? The tape showed Shannon, but was inadequate to reveal whether she was being stalked. Investigators were no closer to finding the truth. As they contemplated what to do next, the investigation veered in an unexpected direction. On May 22, 1996, near Hebronville, Texas, 750 miles from where Shannon was seen forced into a car described as a Chevy Beretta, a vehicle fitting that description erratically swerved away from a border checkpoint. The vehicle had Mississippi plates. One of the patrol guards raced after it, believing the driver to be a potential border jumper or smuggler. In May of 1996, as the investigation continued into the kidnapping and murder of a young Tennessee mother, U.S. Border Patrol agents chased down a fleeing maroon Chevy Beretta with Mississippi plates, the type of car described by witnesses in the abduction. Caught at a dead end, the suspect resisted. Drop it! Drop the knife! Up against the car! Up against the car! Then backed down when confronted by the agent's gun. He had 14 $100 bills in his pocket. The driver said his name was Gerald Lee Powers, but held no driver's license to prove it. A cursory search of the car revealed no illegal drugs or aliens. But in the trunk, border agents recovered a stolen weapon registered in Arkansas. The car was locked and remained in that spot under armed guard until FBI agents could conduct a more thorough search. Special Agent Evan Ray from the FBI field office in Laredo, Texas was contacted since assaulting a border patrol officer is a federal offense. Agent Ray confirmed the identity of the driver when he learned that Gerald Lee Powers had been involved in another altercation at the Mexican border. Uh, I spoke to U.S. Customs Service officials who uh, had indicated that they had had an incident that day as well in which an individual had fled and had left several pieces of identification behind on the counter when they fled. And so we were then in possession of uh, several pieces of identification of Mr. Powers. A license plate check revealed that the vehicle was registered to his wife Sharon in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Agent Ray also discovered that Gerald Lee Powers had a violent past and was currently wanted for questioning in the abduction and murder of Shannon Sanderson. After contacting Memphis authorities, he traveled to Hebronville to process Powers' car on site. The Chevy Beretta matched the vehicle witnesses had described at the abduction. Agents hoped something inside would link the vehicle and powers to the murder of Shannon Sanders. A sheet and pillowcase, along with the trunk liner, were bundled into evidence bags. All right, let's tape this stuff up. We'll get it back to headquarters. When you're retrieving evidence like that, you have no idea what the results of the laboratory examinations are going to be in the end. You uh, just try to get the best uh, and the most evidence that you can and let the lab do their job. Agents were less hopeful they'd find something in the car's interior since it appeared to have been recently cleaned and vacuumed. Hundreds of miles from the nearest evidence response team, Agent Ray improvised with the tools he had at hand. One item that we needed to search for were hairs and fibers in the back seat area. We didn't have the specialized equipment that the evidence response team would have, and so I used an, an unopened lint roller that I had at the office of the type one might use on a, on a suit to, as an adhesive lift. 
Initially obscured by the front seat, the agent found a pink artificial fingernail on the floor. It was similar to those the victim had worn at the time of her abduction. Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen believed this could be the clue that could definitely place Shannon Sanderson in Powers' car. Agent Ray had called us and told us that he had found a fingernail in the back seat area of the uh, floorboard of this vehicle, which is where we had felt that, based upon the witnesses' uh, uh, information they had given us, that, that the victim had been placed in the back seat of the vehicle that took her away. Memphis authorities came to Laredo to question Gerald Lee Powers about the murder. Powers told them that he knew nothing more than what he'd heard on the news. He admitted to being at the casino that night, but had left early to check on his terminally ill neighbor. While the interview continued, investigators spoke to his neighbor in Clarksdale, Mississippi, who denied that Powers had been there at that time. We weren't 100% convinced Gerald Powers was our suspect. We just felt it was kind of suspicious that he was he was trying to give a false alibi. And that, of course, the neighbor was very ill and could have been mistaken because he had been there at different times. Investigators hoped that Powers' wife, Sharon, might be able to corroborate the neighbor's statement. She had initially told police her husband fit the description of the suspect who witnesses glimpsed at the abduction a man who wore a red baseball cap. Now she added that he made frequent trips to the casino where the victim had spent her last night. Still, she did not know if he had visited their neighbor that night and denied that her husband had anything to do with the abduction and murder of Shannon Sanderson. Investigators feared they might just be wasting their time, but FBI Special Agent Jennifer Aiken wasn't so sure. We sensed her ambivalence. We knew that she, you know, had come forward, even with her kind of half-hearted story, we knew she'd come forward for a reason and that there was more she needed to tell. Seconds later, Gerald Lee Powers... Agent Aiken realized that she would need to invest a great deal of time to develop the trust of Sharon Powers. Really, that's tremendous. As the dialogue with Sharon Powers continued over several weeks, the FBI contacted Tom Scott, director of surveillance at the casino where the victim had gambled prior to her abduction. Scott was asked to confirm if Gerald Lee Powers had been recorded that same night on any of the 600 cameras in the 95,000 square foot casino. Jennifer Aiken from the FBI gave us a, uh, a basic description of what the suspect possibly was wearing on the night in question. Um, and that's what we went with, with as, a, as a general description of from color shoes to jeans to a, a certain type jacket and possibly a ball cap. Any given day, uh, you can have approximately 3,000 to 10,000 people within a casino. Scott and his team searched hundreds of hours of footage, looking for a man in a red baseball cap and yellow shirt. Their main focus was the blackjack table where Shannon spent most of the night. If the suspect was stationary, it's, it's pretty easy. But uh, in a casino, it's quite an exciting place to be in and everybody kind of wanders around. And they go to slot machine to slot machine or restaurants or table games. We could not locate the individual. Sharon. Investigators looked to Sharon Powers for more detail about her husband's activities that night. How did you meet your husband? Don't they did what they could to make her feel comfortable. One of her neighbors, a police officer, provided her with reassurance and support. She was a woman torn between her empathy for the victim and her feelings towards her husband. She was in love with this man. I think it was difficult for Sharon to accept the fact that the victim had been a mother of three young children. Um, she herself was a mother of three children and uh, very much related uh, to the victim. Slowly, Sharon Powers worked through her internal conflict. She began to open up, revealing what her home life was like with her husband, Gerald Lee Powers. She said he ruled the house. Her three kids from previous marriages were afraid of him. 
Sharon admitted that she was too. He kept a bell on his chair. When he rang, Sharon came running. Despite his controlling temper, her feelings for him were deep. This is a woman who had really kind of lived under the thumb of uh, Gerald Lee Powers for a, a number of years. I believe by then they had been married four or five years. And uh, she, um, I don't want to say liked it that way, but that was what she was used to. That was familiar. Um, it, was not, uh, it was not familiar to her to be breaking with him, to be disloyal. Despite her fear, Sharon continued to open up to investigators. On April 19th, the day Shannon Sanderson was abducted, Gerald came home acting nervous. Shut up and sit down. Sharon was angry because she thought he'd spent the night with another woman. She noticed blood on his shirt and a cut on his arm. He claimed he'd fallen down at a casino he'd been visiting. Do you remember what color the shirt was? Sharon didn't believe what he told her, but she didn't press it. For now, Sharon refused to say any more, and neither would her husband. Without something stronger, prosecutor Jerry Kitchen would be unable to press charges on Gerald Lee Powers. We still didn't have anything concrete that he had been involved in. It was just an uh, instinct, uh, I think, that uh, was, was leading us at this point that he was our man, but at the time, we did not have the results back from the lab. Investigators hoped the FBI would reinforce their hunch that Gerald Lee Powers was responsible for leaving Shannon Sanderson's children motherless. In the summer of 1996, after Gerald Lee Powers was indicted for assaulting a border patrol officer in Texas, the FBI and Memphis investigators suspected he was also responsible for the murder of a 25-year-old mother of three. But lacking physical evidence, Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen was unable to charge Powers for his involvement or to know for certain if one of the victim's former lovers had hired him to commit the crime. There was always that possibility. Uh, the way she was killed and the manner in which she was abducted, that it appeared like it wasn't just something random, that it had been something planned. All the other suspects that appeared to have a motive or possibly uh, uh, emotional reasons why someone would, would want to have someone killed, like jealousy or rage or uh, other uh, factors. What river? Investigators hoped the suspect's wife, Sharon Powers, could tell them more. Though reluctant at first, after many meetings over several weeks, Sharon grew more comfortable. She finally opened up to FBI Special Agent Jennifer Aiken. When she finally told the story in, in, in its entirety, um, what we heard was really a chilling tale of, of his stalking of the victim and, uh, and the abduction of the victim and then taking her to this rural area and, uh, and robbing her of, of not only the $5,000 that she had won that night, but also of, of the jewelry that she was wearing. Sharon's story was strong, but without corroborating evidence, it would not be enough to convict or even indict Gerald Lee Powers for murder. Trying to help, she told investigators that her husband had thrown the murder weapon, a handgun, into an abandoned canal near the casino in Mississippi. Memphis Police Captain Richard Rolson accompanied local divers to help search for the handgun. Sheriff Department's divers dove into this hole and cr crawled inch by inch searching for this pistol. We never did locate it. And then that's when Miss Powers told us that he had thrown it into the river, which was about 100 yards away. The current at that location was too swift for anybody to dive in the Mississippi River. It left investigators with more doubt and no corroboration that Sharon Powers was telling them the truth. The suspect's wife also told them about a school bus driver from Mississippi whom her husband believed had seen him close to where he dumped Shannon's body. Did you happen to notice the driver? 
Police tracked down the driver who confirmed Sharon's story. At 7 a.m., about two hours after Shannon Sanderson had been abducted, the driver noticed a maroon Chevy Beretta backing down the dirt roadway of the vacant property where the victim's body was later found. The bus driver remembered it because the property had been vacant for so long. Okay, that's what we need to know. Um, but the driver didn't see who was in the car and didn't get the license plate. But I did notice the car. Searching for further corroboration, investigators turned to Tom Scott, director of surveillance of the casino. This time, Sharon Powers provided them locations of where to look for her husband in the 95,000 square foot casino. We did a recreation and did a walkthrough on where, if we were the suspect, where we would have gone through certain areas. And we pulled some tapes. Eventually, we were able to identify just from his shoes in a particular location where the suspect was standing. We pulled a bunch more shots, connected the shoes. We finally put some legs to the shoes. And we're able to identify a person in a distant shot walking through the casino from the upstairs looking down towards the suspect. We then connected more shots and followed the suspect down an escalator, walking past the table where this uh, victim was playing, and followed the uh, suspect out through our front door on videotape. The video was compelling and confirmed Gerald Lee Powers was in the casino that night but it didn't prove that he had abducted or murdered Shannon Sanderson. Hoping for physical evidence that would connect Powers to the victim, investigators searched behind a tavern in Mississippi where Powers' wife claimed he had buried the victim's jewelry. The suspect had told her they were wrapped in tinfoil under a couch in the back. Just as Mrs. Powers described, investigators located a small bundle of foil. Inside, they found pink plastic wrap holding rings identified by the victim's husband as belonging to Shannon. Now they needed to prove forensically that Gerald Lee Powers had in fact been the one who wrapped them. Investigators went to Powers' home to search for the source of that plastic. In the kitchen, they found a roll of pink wrap. They forwarded the roll along with the bundled rings to the lab for comparison. While they waited for the results, investigators turned their attention to the pink artificial nail found inside Powers' car after he was arrested in Texas. From autopsy photos, investigators found at least two nails were missing from the victim's hand. If the nail from the car matched those remaining on the victim's hand, it would prove that Shannon had been in Powers' car that night. But there was a problem. Shannon had already been buried, and her husband was against exhuming her remains. She had already been interred, and so we had uh a hearing in court to have her uh, disinterred and uh, to have the ability to examine these fingernails to see if they were in fact uh, her fingernails or not. Against her husband's wishes, the judge ordered the body exhumed. In early July, three months after the murder, investigators retrieved the body of Shannon Sanderson. The remaining artificial nails were removed and sent to the lab for comparison with the others. The results were negative. The nail in the car wasn't hers. Investigators hoped the other evidence at the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. would provide more promising results. Inside the tinfoil ball recovered in Mississippi, Examiners removed the pink plastic wrap wound tightly around some rings. The FBI needed to connect the rings physically to Gerald Lee Powers. To do so, examiners compared the plastic they were wrapped in to the sample retrieved from Powers' home. The FBI uh, agent who examined it indicated that it wasn't the exact piece that uh, was 
was torn off, but that it matched that roll exactly as far as the polymers and the dye and all that, which showed that this was the source that the, uh, the material had come from that was wrapped around the rings. It was the first piece of forensic evidence linking powers to the victim. But the case was by no means complete. More compelling proof came from a single fiber among several found in Powers' otherwise immaculate car. We have a dress fiber uh, that was found in the vehicle that he was driving that night that matches the fiber from the dress that the victim was wearing. Um, and that was very significant as well. Authorities were convinced that Gerald Lee Powers had murdered Shannon Sanderson, but they weren't convinced he'd acted alone. They believed it was possible that others from her past could claim a motive for wanting Shannon dead. Memphis prosecutor Jerry Kitchen decided to confirm it with Powers himself. So we went to Laredo to interview uh, the defendant before we charged him with this murder. Uh, and there was the possibility if he cooperated and was able to prove to us that someone else was involved, that we would withdraw seeking the death penalty. Uh, but there was nothing that he was able to provide us with, so we were convinced then at that point that no one else had been involved in her uh, abduction and murder and proceeded uh, with charging him alone. Powers had plenty of time to contemplate this murder. He watched her for several hours in the casino then followed her for another hour back to Memphis. He had ample time to change his mind. Instead, he hardened his resolve. Get out of there! Move. He abducted a mother of three, robbed her, on, then up. shot her at point blank. The criminal court in Tennessee didn't need much time to decide Powers' fate. After deliberating only 15 minutes, the jury recommended death for the murder of Shannon Sanderson. Gerald Lee Powers awaits execution at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Tennessee. In Kokomo, Indiana, an unthinkable crime terrified residents. A young woman disappeared, apparently kidnapped. After several days of searching, a former FBI profiler narrowed the suspect list to one. Agents and detectives followed the trail across state lines, hoping to find the victim before her time ran out. Drops of blood and a torn window screen were all that was left to tell authorities what happened to a woman in Indiana. The 21-year-old victim was snatched from her home on a bright spring morning. She appeared to have no real enemies. There was no clear motive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In an abduction case, every second counts. This case was plagued by false leads and blind alleys, each one using up valuable time as agents raced to find the victim. Late spring, 1998, Howard County, Indiana. The rural Midwestern farming region was already enduring its first heat wave of the season. Those who weren't farmers stayed inside to avoid the heat. 21-year-old Anita Woldridge was one of them. Um, could you hold on for a second? Thanks. She planned to have lunch with her grandparents and boyfriend before her afternoon shift at a shipping company. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up at around noon. 
I have to go. Okay. But she would never make it. At about 12.30, Anita's mother returned home from work. She was surprised to see her daughter's boyfriend standing out front. Anita's car was gone, but it was unlike her daughter to miss an appointment or to leave the garage door open. Her mother also noticed that the screen from the kitchen window that faced the garage had been removed. Perhaps someone had broken into the house. The front door was unlocked. Anita! Anita was nowhere to be found. Anita! Anita! In the kitchen, Mrs. Wooldridge spotted blood on the kitchen table and floor. Oh my God. Uh, yes, uh, I need to... She called 911. Howard County Sheriff's Anita. Chief Detective Steve Rogers responded to the call. I don't know that any of us really knew exactly what we had at that time. We just knew that we had uh, some very suspicious circumstances. We had what appeared to be uh, a possibly a forced entry and that the screen had been removed and that some blood indicated that there could have been a violent act. The detective issued an APB for Anita and her blue sedan and called in a forensic team that included officers from the nearby city of Kokomo. Technicians recorded the scene while the evidence was still fresh. They retrieved blood from the kitchen, but could not determine if it was Anita's without a sample from the missing girl. The screen found in the garage had been forced out from the kitchen window. Investigators dusted the area for prints. None that were lifted yielded any clues. Detectives interviewed Anita's parents to learn more about their daughter. They described her as a responsible young woman who held a steady job and who would never break plans without calling. We had a missing person that was responsible and would not have just run off. We found nothing in our uh, interviews with witnesses, uh, talking to family members that Anita had any problems at home, that she would have just taken off without any explanation. Okay, good. The detective questioned Anita's boyfriend, who she had been dating for several months. He claimed to have arrived at Anita's at about 11.45 and had been there for 45 minutes when her mother pulled up. Before that, he had been with friends until around 11. That left 90 minutes during which his activities could not be corroborated. He had no idea where Anita might be and agreed to come to the station for further questioning if necessary. Authorities examined Anita's bedroom. Mrs. Wooldridge pointed out that Anita's work clothes were still there. She spoke to her daughter's supervisor, but he said Anita had not yet arrived. Supervisor's name is Mr. Johnson. 4512345. The detective called again to see if she had ever shown up. Her employer told us that you know she shows up when she's got a cold she works when she's not feeling well she's very dependable uh, and then the fact that she didn't show up for work that particular day was very significant mrs. Wooldridge said that the only thing missing from Anita's room was a red bathrobe that she had recently embroidered for her daughter forensic technicians retrieved hair samples from Anita's brush to begin the lengthy process of mapping her DNA In the bathroom, Anita had left her glasses and contacts behind. She couldn't drive without them. But her car and her keys were gone. Mr. and Mrs. Wooldridge had also discovered that their bed had been stripped of its comforter and the sheets were rumpled. Investigators suspected that Anita may have been raped there. Forensic technicians processed the room for any physical evidence. Okay. 
They examined the bed with ultraviolet light, searching for seminal fluid on the sheets and blankets. The bedding was clean. In the garage, a detective found a wad of electrical tape. Long strands of hair that resembled Anita's were tangled inside. Police suspected it had been wrapped around the victim's head to hold a gag. If that were true, it may have meant that Anita was taken from the house alive. Detectives spread out from the house looking for witnesses. There was a neighborhood search conducted by talking to neighbors and walking areas and um, see if she had been seen anywhere. Uh, and at the same time, we were trying to develop any, po any potential suspects by talking to um, people that, that she routinely came in contact with. A deputy interviewed a neighbor who lived across the street from the Wooldridges. He remembered seeing someone in front of their house that morning. At about 10.30, the neighbor spotted a man carrying a blue backpack heading towards the front door. He saw no one else outside after he returned from his errand a half hour later. He couldn't remember if Anita's car was gone by then. Deputies were left with only hunches as to what had happened. We assumed that the worst could be uh, an abduction, but we definitely knew we had a missing person. Um, so we just wanted to at least, uh, at, the, at the very outset, cover the, all the basics of preserving the crime scene, uh, um, obtaining any evidence that we possibly could, and then start in the next stage of the investigation, which would be doing as much background on the victim and trying to identify a suspect in, uh, in an abduction if that's what's happened. After 24 hours and dozens of interviews, no one had seen Anita or her car. Detectives interviewed a man who was a friend of Anita's father. Not really. He claimed that he had spoken to Anita on the phone the morning that she disappeared. The Wooldridge's records confirmed it. Can you tell me about the phone conversation? The man said he called at about 10.30 or so and asked to speak to Mr. Wooldridge. Hey. Anita okay. said her father wasn't there and that she was the only one home. Right now. Um, Before she could take a message, she asked him to hold on. Someone was at the door. Anita came back to the phone only to say she had to go. She did not say who had come to the house. Like Increasingly, detectives were convinced that Anita met with foul play. I've got to go. Did you say who was up? If this was a kidnapping, investigators suspected that whoever was responsible would make contact with the Wooldridges. Technicians tapped the family's phone line. They would be ready if a call came in. Investigators also began to search for anyone who might have had reason to harm Anita. We had no immediate suspects other than we started looking into all those people that had been in contact with Anita recently. Detectives interviewed Anita's co-workers at the shipping company. They claimed Anita didn't have any problems with anyone at the job. But they did remember something a few weeks before she disappeared. At a place where the employees often went to relax, Anita's co-workers saw a man approach Anita. He worked with them at the shipping company and had had several drinks before he started teasing Anita. Anita was polite but clearly annoyed. The witnesses thought he didn't appear too happy that Anita had brushed him off. Up they added that the man had not shown up for work the day that Anita disappeared. Uh -huh. And you can tell by the look on her face, she did not like it. Morning, Detectives went to question the employee who was at home. Any disappearance of Anita? 
Yeah. And I'm he claimed that his encounter with Anita in the restaurant was an innocent exchange. We're friends. We're co-workers. On the morning she disappeared, he said he came into work before his shift and explained to his supervisor that he needed the day off. He wanted to work on his car. His supervisor confirmed the alibi. As the hours ticked by, family and friends posted missing persons flyers throughout the area. They asked for anyone to call with information about their daughter or her car. They also contacted the media to spread the word beyond Kokomo. Air surveillance and concerned citizens fanned out across the rural region to assist officers in the search. A lot of lanes and back roads are in the uh, extreme portions of this county. We had volunteer groups. The uh, uh, Civil Defense uh, actually went out and formed uh, organized searches of wooded areas. We felt that if we could find her vehicle, that that would give us some evidence to lead us in, in another direction. 48 hours after Anita had disappeared, Detective Rogers received a promising tip from the mother of one of Anita's friends. The woman reported that Anita was having problems with another co-worker at the shipping company. Anita said that the man had sexually harassed her on the job. She was concerned enough to file a complaint against him. Anita told the mother that if she wound up in a dumpster somewhere, you would know who did it. Investigators hoped they could find her before it was too late. They knew every hour she was gone lessened the likelihood Anita would be found alive. Did he say anything about Detectives returned to the shipping company. The supervisor told them that he had no record of a sexual harassment complaint filed against the employee. He added that the man had resigned three weeks earlier and left the state for college. The suspect remained on the list until detectives could determine his whereabouts at the time of Anita's disappearance. While the lead was being checked, investigators continued their search for suspects in the area. They asked Anita's boyfriend to take a lie detector test since his alibi could not be corroborated on the morning Anita went missing. The test consisted of only two questions. Did he have anything to do with the disappearance of Anita Wooldridge? And did he know where Anita could be found? He answered no to both, but was found to be deceptive. He remained a suspect, though police had no evidence with which to hold him. After two days of searching, investigators were no closer to finding the missing woman. And the chances that she was still alive decreased with each passing day. Two days after 21-year-old Anita Woolridge disappeared from her suburban home in Indiana, Howard County sheriffs had identified her co-worker and her boyfriend as possible suspects in her abduction. Though evidence found at her house suggested that she'd been taken alive, Investigators knew that time was against them. Detectives spoke to Anita's friends to find out more. Most conveyed that they didn't know anyone who would want to hurt Anita, especially her boyfriend. One friend, who had previously worked with Anita at a gym two years earlier, said that Anita was nice to everyone, including difficult people. She recalled a member from the gym whose behavior towards the women there was crass. What's wrong? His name was Victor Steele. They found him offensive. Is that Steele? Yes. But he remained undeterred. Steele bothered Anita in the same way. No number. Oh, no. How about a towel? Yeah, I'll take that. But she remained characteristically polite when she rejected him, according to Detective Steve Rogers. What did I do? Anita uh, w was a personality that she was always very forgiving and, and willing to try to work with anyone and that she had made an extra effort to try to get along with this individual. That, um, the man's behavior never changed and his membership was eventually terminated. S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. 
Anita's friend remembered that Victor Steele lived in Howard County at the time. Investigators checked on Steele's background. When his name came up, uh, we were able to locate uh, his name in the Indiana Sex Offender Registry and learn from that that he had been convicted in Monroe County, uh, I believe in 1984, of an abduction. Though Detective Rogers didn't know if Steele had any contact with Anita in the past two years, he believed Steele was the most promising suspect so far. To substantiate his theory, the detective turned to retired FBI profiler Steve McVeigh for guidance. He had uh, three or four people that he had to, to look at as suspects. He's uh, wanting to see if we can narrow these down and to give uh, some focus to the case. Uh, he has limited resources, and certainly time was the most critical of those. And, and if we could focus, then uh, we'd be a little bit better off. The profiler examined the crime scene reports and the backgrounds of each suspect. 41-year-old Victor Steele's background stood out. The circumstances surrounding Steele's conviction 15 years earlier had many similarities to Anita's disappearance. In December of 1984, Steele had stalked a woman on an Indiana University campus where he was a student. One night, he waited outside for her boyfriend to leave. Like Anita, the young woman had previously turned down his advances. Knowing she was alone, Steele approached the house. When the woman answered her door, Steele pushed his way inside. He pulled a knife from a blue backpack and threatened to kill her if she did not submit to being raped. He'd had contact with her. Uh, he didn't live all that far from her. He carried the backpack that he had, the uh, same as in the first instance, which he used as a crime kit where he brought his tape, his ropes, and whatever else that he was going to use. And uh, that's very, very distinctive. After raping her, he forced her to walk with him at knife point. He told her to act like they were lovers or else he would stab her. The profiler recognized that part of Steele's fantasy was to feel like he was her boyfriend. He had hoped to make this gal love him, his victim love him. Uh, he, he didn't look at it as a rape. Now, 15 years later, if, if it were, were the same guy, he would have the same signature, but he would be more sophisticated about it. Most importantly, Steele did not kill his victim. He released her on the condition that she would not call the cops. She agreed, then ran to the nearest phone to call 911. Victor Steele was arrested hours later. I think that he looks back on the case in 1984 as a mistake, that he, uh, that he was not thorough enough in indoctrinating her or winning her over as, uh, as sufficiently as he thought he had. And then when he let her go, she identified him and sent him to prison. Victor Steele served eight years behind bars for first degree rape and abduction. He was distraught open over the conviction. Guys, open two. In prison, Steele attempted suicide twice. If he had abducted Anita, he was not going to make the same mistake again. Victor Steele wanted to find a lady that he could, in effect, make love him. And if he couldn't, if it didn't work, then he was prepared, in my opinion, to kill her. And so love me or I'll kill you is a very succinct uh, description of what went on in this case. The profiler stressed the importance of not revealing the investigation to Steele. So Mike, uh, Steve, what if the suspect felt this? police were on to him, he, he would probably kill Anita and himself. Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple was called in to work undercover and help locate the suspect. The task of finding him involved us immediately in doing a a surveillance of his last known residence, which was the home of his mother, which was on the outskirts of our city here in Howard County. 
Two and a half days after Anita disappeared, police set up outside the Steele residence. No one was seen entering or leaving. They needed a way to find out who was inside without blowing their cover. A car parked in front might be their way in. We observed that there was a vehicle for sale outside of his house. Uh, we seized on that as an opportunity to establish contact under a ruse of being interested in making the purchase of the car, recognizing that we wouldn't have to compromise our identity. Posing as potential buyers, undercover officers wearing wires prepared to make contact with whoever was home. They had no idea if Steele or Anita were inside. The suspect might do anything to protect his freedom. Every moment's delay dwindled the possibility that Anita remained alive. In June of 1998, investigators searched for convicted rapist Victor Steele in the abduction of a missing Indiana woman. Two and a half days after her disappearance, police set up surveillance outside his last known residence. Undercover detectives posing as used car buyers planned to make contact with the 41-year-old suspect. Though each hour that passed decreased the victim's chances for survival, Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple believed that there was still hope. A sexual predator would enjoy a sense of self-assurance by way of his having made it from the scene with his captive victim. Uh, that that probably presented a window of opportunity to, to, uh, to us as investigators that she would still be kept alive. Wired for their own safety, they knew that approaching the house may put the victim at risk if Victor Steele discovered that he was a suspect, according to retired FBI profiler Steve McVeigh. I told him, tell your guys you've got to be extremely discreet uh, in this whole investigation, although we must press because time is of the essence. Uh, we have to do it in such a way that it arouses absolutely zero suspicion on Victor's part. And if he had any suspicion whatsoever that, that he had come under suspicion of the police, then he would dispose of her. An older woman answered the door. She told the undercover detectives that the car for sale belonged to her son, Victor. The detectives said they were ready to buy now and were invited inside to discuss the price in the vehicle's history. The mother claimed that her son had moved to Wisconsin a few weeks earlier. Without her permission or a warrant, detectives were unable to search the house independently. They believed she was not likely involved, but they weren't convinced that she wouldn't alert her son to the search. She added that Victor hadn't hooked up his phone yet in Wisconsin, so she had no way to reach him. No, no, he's going to She would have to speak with him before she could set a price. The detectives promised to keep in touch and looked forward to speaking to the owner himself. The FBI profiler remained confident Victor Steele was the primary suspect. We could not eliminate him, and in fact, the secure place that, that uh, I thought he would have taken her to and where he could spend a significant amount of time with her could, might very well be in a totally different area where no one knew him at all and no one would uh, have any idea of looking for him there. And that he very likely had gone and prepared a place and had in fact come back and taken her without his mother ever even knowing it. 24-hour surveillance by undercover officers continued as other team members discreetly gathered more background on Steele. They learned he was unemployed and owned a red pickup, but they could not figure out where he was staying. With each passing day, pressure to find the suspect and the victim mounted upon Howard County Chief Detective Steve Rogers. We wanted to find this young lady alive. People were looking at us and saying, well, gosh, can't you do something? And uh, we weren't at liberty to talk about what we were doing and what we, what we thought we could get done. Uh, we had to be very guarded with that information. 
Victor Steele's credit card statements revealed that he had rented a truck in Indiana a few days before the crime. Company records showed that Steele had traveled 910 miles round trip. Investigators divided the distance in half and traced a 450 mile circle around Kokomo, Indiana. One town that intersected was La Crosse, Wisconsin. Steele's credit card records also showed that he purchased gas at a convenience store on the date he rented the truck. Detectives called the parent company to determine the store's location. It was near La Crosse, Wisconsin. They notified the FBI that it was likely Victor Steele had crossed state lines with the victim. FBI Special Agent David Fitzgerald of the Eau Claire, Wisconsin resident agency was assigned the case. We were able to offer them the ability to, to bring in other agents if need be to uh, conduct investigation um, anywhere within the state of Wisconsin. And if things were going to lead out of the state of Wisconsin, uh, the FBI is, is one of those agencies that has a network in place where we can contact people all over the country uh, to help them out. Six days after 21-year-old Anita Wooldridge disappeared, her missing blue sedan was found close to her home on a suburban street in Howard County, Indiana. It was just a few miles from Steele's house. The car was unlocked, and the keys were still in the ignition. Investigators feared Anita's body might be stashed in the trunk. She was not there, but her red bathrobe was. Underneath, they found evidence that was more encouraging. Severed electrical ties. This was a very important thing with the profiler. He indicated to us that if these had been used to secure her arms or legs, that when they were cut from her, that would be to assist her in getting out of the vehicle. There was a good possibility that she was at least alive when she was taken out of the trunk. Detectives found no blood, seminal fluid, or other signs of struggle in the vehicle. Nor did they find fingerprints far into the car. From the driver's side window, they were able to lift what they believed was an elbow print. Technicians preserved it in the hopes it would match their suspect. Detective Rogers asked the profiler whether they should allocate a portion of his limited resources to the search in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Steve Rogers asked me if, if I thought it was worth him taking a troop of his people uh, to uh, Wisconsin to look for. We even had the name of a town where a gas purchase had been made. Now, that was really iffy uh, in terms of that specific town being exactly where she, uh, he had her. That part I was not certain at, at all about, but we had nothing else at that point. A contingent of Indiana detectives headed for La Crosse, Wisconsin, where they believed Steele had taken Anita. They met with Special Agent David Fitzgerald and La Crosse police at a command center in the city of 50,000. They really didn't have any specific information that Victor was here and he was here now, uh, nor did they have any specific information that the victim, Anita, was here and, and was here now. Um, and they kind of looked at us and said, you guys must think we're crazy for being here. But, you know, they had been up for a day and a half and felt pretty strongly that something was going to happen in our area, and we were just there to help them. Not wasting any time, that evening, investigators split up into several teams, looking for Steele's red pickup truck on the streets of La Crosse until four in the morning. But without an address or even a general location of where Steele and his victim may be, the search was fruitless. Once again, they turned to FBI profiler Steve McVeigh to help eliminate locations. They asked me whether they were looking for a life a victim or a dead body. I replied that it was most likely that she was still alive and would be as long as he thought he could control her and that, uh, and that he was not under suspicion by the police. Uh, that he would keep her for a fairly significant amount of time. He would keep her in a place that he had uh, absolute control over and felt totally secure. Investigators clung to hope, 
that a week after her disappearance, Anita Wooldridge was still alive. Seven days after 21-year-old Anita Wooldridge had disappeared from her suburban Indiana home, authorities believed it was possible that she was still alive. They suspected convicted rapist Victor Steele was holding her somewhere in La Crosse, Wisconsin. But Chief Detective Steve Rogers had no proof and no known address. We had a hope that she was alive. We did not know that she was alive. This was our last ditch effort um, to, to find her. Um, in the sense of finding her alive, that we had to get there, set up a command post, and be ready for when we received the information where he could possibly be. Remember us? To get it, undercover detectives wearing hidden transmitters returned to Steele's last known residence, his mother's home in Howard County, Indiana. Posing as interested buyers for the suspect's used car out front, officers hoped to glean Steele's whereabouts from his mother. Kokomo City Detective Michael Holzapple was aware of the danger. Our concern was that if we were discovered making our inquiries regarding Victor Steele at this stage of the investigation, that we might be contributing to the murder of this victim, that it might place her life at immediate risk. It was a risk they had to take. His mother maintained that she still didn't have a telephone number for her son in Wisconsin. But she did have an address. The undercover officer repeated the address out loud to his partner so it could be heard by detectives listening outside. He immediately called Chief Detective Steve Rogers at the FBI office in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Captain, I got the address. My team people are in the street with the uh, La Crosse uh, Police Department and the La Crosse FBI. And I'm relaying this information, and uh, at that particular point, when I tell them, do you have a Clint Street in La Crosse? And they looked at me rather strange and said, yes. Uh, I said, that's where he's at. FBI and La Crosse detectives arrived in minutes. They identified the red pickup truck parked outside as Victor Steele's. As soon as Victor Steele's vehicle and residence were, in fact, under surveillance, I requested assistance uh, with the local authorities there to go to a local court, a uh, local magistrate, and apply for a search warrant for the address on Clinton Street and for Victor Steele's vehicle and for the person of Victor Steele. While they waited for the warrants, agents contacted the owner who lived close by to find out if Steele had in fact rented the house. He confirmed the suspect was his tenant. Steele had claimed that he wanted to turn the building into a bookstore. The landlord provided a sketch of the building's interior layout. He also gave the FBI a key to the front door. Outside the rental property, investigators consulted the FBI profiler. They asked him what the chances were that Steele was holding Anita inside the building. Profiler Steve McVeigh warned that if she was there, getting to her safely would be difficult. They were trying to determine whether they needed to storm the place or whether that was even the place that he would have her or not. So I, I, I was confident he did in fact have her there. She would be very well secured. I did tell him that I thought there was at least a 50-50 chance that should they attempt to storm the place while he's there, that he would kill himself and kill her too. Investigators had no way to confirm who was inside. If they waited to go in, they might be too late. We were again calculating with the resounding thump of this clock ticking in the back of each of our minds and our hearts as to whether or not do we make an entry, do we wait. Do we stage a surveillance, watch and wait? Do we go ahead and force an entry? That decision was in part made by us witnessing Victor Steele leave the residence. After a week of searching, investigators got their first glimpse of the suspect. He climbed into his truck and drove away. The surveillance team followed, but decided it would be imprudent to stop him for questioning. 
one of the risks that we did face is let's say he had uh, Anita at another location that was not the residence and he decided that he did not want to cooperate with us and he just left. He may never go to that place again and we may never find any. Agents track steel to a lumber yard. The detective followed the suspect inside. Steele seemed interested in long planks of wood. I witnessed him make purchase of lumber. That in itself was a chilling observation and a bit of information to convey back to the surveillance team uh, because we had thoughts in mind, what's he using lumber for? To make a, a cage, to make a coffin. The detective reported back to the other investigators. They watched as Steele returned to his pickup with the lumber. Check it out. Call him on the way out. Investigators continued their tale. Steele retraced the route he had taken from his rental property. They had to decide soon if they were going to risk stopping him without knowing for sure where he was going or where he had stashed Anita. If he had her alive and she was somewhere else, he would have went to her by now. But since he had not been away from the residence to any other location, we felt strongly that she, if she was alive, that she would still be there at that residence. They decided they weren't going to let Steele return to the rental property. Take him down, take a him down. A lacrosse detective radioed to a uniformed officer to stop the pickup. The decision would mean the difference between life and death for Anita Woolridge. Eight days after a 21-year-old Indiana woman was abducted from her home, the FBI and local authorities stopped the prime suspect in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They believed Victor Steele was holding Anita Woolridge in a rented house nearby, but they had no proof that she was there or that she was still alive. Since they did not have enough to arrest the suspect, a La Crosse police cruiser pulled the pickup to the side of the road on the pretense of a routine traffic stop. Then the FBI approached. Special Agent David Fitzgerald asked the suspect if he would assist in their investigation. He wasn't under arrest, and I, I didn't want to make him feel like he was. I had no probable cause that I was aware of at that time to arrest Mr. Steele, and I just wanted to, to have a conversation with him. Steele agreed to cooperate and accompanied agents back to the FBI office. The sex offender claimed to know nothing about Anita Woldridge's disappearance and lied about where he was living. Mr. Steele indicated that he thought that he had been stopped by law enforcement officers for his failure to register as a sex offender in the state of Wisconsin. And he indicated that he had been in Wisconsin for a couple days uh, and that he was staying in his truck. At Steele's rental property, investigators prepared for entry. They would be ready when they got word the warrant was signed by a judge. It was a difficult wait for Detective Michael Holzer. The greatest anxious moments uh, of the investigation I, I would describe occurred in awaiting the arrival physically of a search warrant that was being then prepared at our command center. Uh, we had Victor Steele. He was no present threat to anyone. We didn't know what the condition or circumstance uh, Anita was suffering at that moment. They got the warrant. The entry team used the key provided by the landlord. 
They exercised extreme caution, aware that the place may be booby-trapped. Anita! Police! Officers swept through the rooms, including the basement, announcing their presence. But the team heard no answer to their calls. Closet clear. Closet clear! It appeared they had been wrong. At the FBI office in La Crosse, an agent and detective continued their interview with Victor Steele. Nope. The suspect admitted that he once knew a woman named Anita from a health club, but he hadn't seen her for a while. Without Steele's cooperation, investigators realized they may never find Anita. And they didn't have enough to place him under arrest. Again, Mr. Steele indicated that he couldn't help law enforcement officers. Uh, he talked about the fact that he was uh, not under arrest, he was detained, and he basically said, do what you gotta do to get me out of here. Anita! FBI! In the last room, authorities spotted a large metal cabinet lying face up on the floor. Its doors appeared to be secured with a broken broom handle and a butter knife. We didn't communicate verbally at, at that particular time, but the communication was clear that we wanted to be cautious of booby traps. We wanted to be cautious about disturbing evidence, but we needed to open that cabinet. The team members believed, dead or alive, the search for Anita was at an end. They saw no suspicious devices attached to the box, nor did they hear movement from within. Carefully, they freed the cabinet's handles. After eight days, yes. Anita was alive. It, it was hard for me to believe that it was really going to be over. And they opened the box, and there's like five or six police officers standing there. And I'm like, thank God, take me home. Anita Wooldridge told her rescuers that though she was not gagged, she had been conditioned by Victor Steele not to call out. He told me he might make fake noises, so if I would scream for help, then he would kill me. And then when the police actually came to the door, I was still afraid to scream because I thought he might be playing a tape or making it up. She was handed over to the emergency medical technicians. Except for dehydration, she remained healthy even after her long ordeal. Victor Steele was placed under arrest for kidnapping and sexual assault. He remained unfazed. Victor really was not remorseful about what he had done. It, it, it appeared to me that it, if there was any remorse, it was in the fact that he had been caught. From the health club where you Anita had little to eat during her captivity. She ate her first meal as she explained to investigators the events that began eight days earlier. Victor Steele arrived at her home at about 10.30. She recognized him from the health club and invited him in. He told her he had been out riding a bike and asked if he could come in for a glass of water. Didn't seem like a big deal that he came to the door. I knew he rode his bike everywhere and I mean, it was really hot that day. And I just never second thought I was gonna get him a glass of water, send him on his way. Anita asked Steele to wait while she wiped up blood from the kitchen floor where she had cut herself earlier. When her back was turned, Steele drew a stun gun from his backpack. I didn't know what was happening, it was all so fast, and I realized, you know, I'm being attacked, and I started screaming, even though I knew no one's gonna hear me, all the windows are shut and air conditioners are on. And then when he hit me in the stomach, it's just, I lost all control of my legs, like they just went limp. Steele disguised himself in women's clothes before he left the house. He first grabbed the bedspread, then Anita's robe to cover her bound wrists. He tried to shove her out the kitchen window, but decided it was easier to walk her to the car. Keep your mouth shut. He locked her in the trunk. 
Before taking her to Wisconsin, he brought her to his mother's house and raped her. I'd always thought I'd rather die than be raped, and, and then it was almost like survival mode took over my body. It was like, okay, we're going to get through this, and I'm going to do everything in my power not to die like this and have my parents with unanswered questions. So you understand me? Get in. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, right. Steele showed her a metal wardrobe yeah. that would be her hand new hand. home. He threatened to kill her if she tried to escape. Don't you bother. Anita agreed not to try, but Steele didn't trust her. I'll take that forward. I'll beat you with it. He left a quarter on top of the wardrobe to indicate if she tried to get out. I didn't like being confined like that, but at least if I was in there, I knew he couldn't touch me. But it also made it very dreadful every time I heard the box open because I knew I was either going to have to play games with him or be raped or he had to see him. Anita returned home to the warm welcome of friends and family. <laughs> Detective Michael Holzapple was surprised the case ended as well as it had. Having worked so many broken bodies, so many fractured stories, so many occasions that it didn't, it didn't come out like you would wish, that you would hope. Although this this young woman suffered a, an incredibly uh, uh, a devastating victimization, she's still alive and uh, people work together to support her in bringing her home alive. Victor Steele acted as his own attorney in his January 1999 trial and was convicted of kidnapping, carjacking, and weapons possession. He was sentenced to life without parole and serves his time in the United States Penitentiary in Beaumont, Texas. I think my goals in life are a little bit different. I never thought of doing anything in law enforcement, and now that's something I'm looking into, that I would like to do that to help other people. And um, it just it gives me a goal that, you know, I want other people like him off the streets. And so that's a little bit different than my original plan in life. The life-changing experience would have shattered many others. But Anita Woldridge transcended her ordeal because of her strong personality and individual faith. She now hopes to become an FBI agent to help others as they helped her. <laughs>